welcome. Thanks for joining us. May the Holy Spirit work in your life as you hear this message. I remember what an absolutely beautiful day it was. The sky was, its, was this beautiful blue. There were very few clouds. When I got into my office, I took one last look out the window and then went to my desk. Then, all of a sudden, this bang happened. The bang and being thrown out of my chair and having the door partially opened, it like all happened at the same time. The conference room that was on my left, the ceiling fell down and cracked the conference room table. I'm getting up and said, how the heck did they get a bomb this high? Because what else could it be? Then I said, I think I'd better get my things together. And then the people from MetLife came across, and some of them had blackened faces. They said, a plane hit the building. We watched it. We saw it hit the building, and our office exploded. Shortly after that, Pablo came to our door. All I remember is that yellow helmet, a flashlight, and him standing at the front door saying, we have to go now. We made a turn and went directly down the hallway. At the very last door was an exit. Pablo and Mr. DiMartini had broken through that door because when the plane hit the building, it had buckled all the frameworks from the doors so nobody could open them. I'm so grateful that Somebody came to that floor because even if we had gone to that exit, we wouldn't have been able to get out. One of the scariest things was, I don't remember what floor we were on, but water started coming down the stairs, and it was like a waterfall. And there were people huddled together because it was dark. And then Teresa took out her keychain, and it had a little light on it. And I said, oh, wow, I, I have a flashlight in my pocketbook. I found it and held it up, and people in the back said, thank you. But I had to turn the corner. There was no more light left for them. The worst time was when the other building went down. This tremendous roar, and the stairways shook, and we were holding on to the banister, and the building is shaking, and no one said a word. I started to cry when we were almost out of the building. We're almost downstairs to the main floor. Teresa and Raphael went down and disappeared. And people in the back of me went up and disappeared. I'm standing in this little place, and I'm by myself. And I didn't know if I should run downstairs or upstairs. And I started to cry because I didn't know what to do. And then someone who was above me said, come up this way, come this way. And I ran up the flight of stairs to meet him. When I walked through the exit to the outside, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I realized what a mess I was when I finally saw myself because when I walked past a store and I turned around and I looked, I didn't recognize myself. My hair was white. My pants were black to the knee. My face was covered with ash. I didn't recognize myself. These are the words of Diane DeFantis, who climbed down the stairs from her office on the 89th floor of the World Trade Center just minutes after the attacks of September 11, 2001. You can find hers and other survivor stories on the 9-11 Memorial and Museum website. It's fascinating listening. Meanwhile, in those very minutes, my mom was working downtown. She heard the first plane. She saw the second plane. She saw the towers collapsing and the people who couldn't make it down the stairs, well, she saw them falling out of the building. At some point, 
as she was walking home, like Miss DeFantis, she stopped in the middle of the sidewalk and began to cry. And someone she didn't know, a stranger, a good Samaritan, really, took a hold of her and guided her next to a building. See, my mom was 64 years old at the time. He pointed out that a crowd of people were running her way. And if it hadn't been for that man helping her, she could have been trampled. When disaster strikes, how we respond reveals the truth about ourselves. Thank God for people who help. In these departing days of summer, we're searching for God in the midst of our ever-changing reality. How is God with us in times of national crisis? A lot of people lose their faith in times like this. And how might we respond in times of conflict? Because a lot of people forget or forsake what they say they value the most. When we have deep questions as a people of faith, we are blessed to have the wisdom of Scripture. When we read our Bible faithfully, we come to understand that our ancestors also had very similar experiences, and yet they found God in them. Let's open our Bibles, the Bibles we brought, the Bibles in our pews, or the apps on our phones, and turn to Isaiah chapter 2, first verse. And I know we put the words up on the screen and they're easy to read, but there is something to be said about holding the Bible in our hands as we read and hear. Now, in this early part of Isaiah, the people of Jerusalem face a devastating invasion. They face terrible destruction. And the people of Judah have lost their way, and Isaiah foretells the consequences. But then God envisions the rebuilding of His people. And through His people, all the nations of the world will come to know God. Let's read Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come... The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. If you ever visit New York City and you find yourself on 42nd Street and 1st Avenue, you will find these very words etched on a wall just across the street from the United Nations. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. This verse reminds me of when Diane DeFontes was walking down that darkened staircase. Can you just imagine having to walk down 89 flights of stairs in the dark with water pouring down your feet? And she and her friend, as they found other people in living, existing in this darkness, in this desperate time, well, they took out their flashlights, lighting their way for others. And when Mr. Fontes was lost, 
Someone guided her to safety. In times of crisis, how might people of faith respond? Shall we simply say, every man for himself, I got my own, you're on your own? Or shall we shine a light? And when we find ourselves in times of conflict, how might we respond? With vengeful violence that only begets more violence? Or might we walk in the way that God offers through Isaiah's voice? For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. Instruction. The Hebrew word here is Torah, which we also translate as law. The word of the Lord shall come from Jerusalem. He shall judge and arbitrate between peoples. If we were to ask the God of our scriptures how we might respond when our relationships go bad, well, here's how God might respond. Let's return to our basic teaching. To love one another. To love the foreigners and aliens among us. And to love and care even for our enemies. Our mission as a people of faith is to let the world know that God loves them. And how else will they know that God loves them unless we do the same? The people of God live in this world, but we are not of it. Remember that line from the Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Romans? If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. That's Romans 12, 20. Well, as we were reading Proverbs over the summer, I realized that Paul is simply paraphrasing Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. If your enemies are hungry, give them bread to eat. And if they are thirsty, give them water to drink, for you will heap coals of fire on their heads, and the Lord will reward you. You see, the concern for the well-being of our enemies does not simply begin in the New Testament. It actually flows throughout the Bible. And when conflict happens, when adversity appears, we as a people of faith would do well to return to our scriptures to live in the way that we say we value the most and do everything that we can to walk in the light of our Lord. I was in New York City on September 11th, 2001 as well. I was taking a day off from work and I was sleeping in way uptown And um, I remember during that week, it was one of the most beautiful weeks weather-wise ever, I remember going jogging down by the Hudson River and looking all the way downtown, and for days, this plume of ash and smoke was rising into the sky. And I remember the dirty looks I got riding on the subway and jogging down the street. And I just remember how angry I felt that guys who looked like me would do something like this. Because I gotta say, they ruin it for all of us. So like many other Americans, I was angry. And frankly, I wanted to blow up the other side of the planet. 
Thank God I was not in charge of anything. (laughs) But see, back then I didn't have a scriptural foundation. I hadn't heard very many sermons about love thy neighbor. And I knew nothing about John Wesley, whose approach to Christian living involved seeing other human beings as God's children and reaching out to as many people from as many backgrounds as possible. It was by the grace of God and through the teachings of my elders and my church friends and my professors at Drew Theological School that my eyes were opened and my heart was strengthened to express the love of God even to an enemy. To love people with whom we are in conflict requires far more courage, far more strength, far more resilience, and far more faith than to commit acts of violence or to foster hatred. And if I'm honest, I still have a long way to go in living this out. Let's, let's be clear, though. As individuals and as a people, I believe that we do have a God-given right and an obligation to defend ourselves, to stand up for what we believe and what we value and to protect our children and our families and our friends and our way of life and thank God for all of the people who selflessly put themselves in harm's way to protect us. But as a person of faith, As a member of the United Methodist Church, it is also my role, and indeed it is all our role, collectively to serve as God's messengers, to continue to offer the world a divine vision of nation not lifting sword up against nation and not forcing our children and our grandchildren to learn war. So let's learn from the grace the sinner showed by Christ our Lord. Christ came into the world and revealed the inviting, welcoming, restoring, healing, nourishing word and power of God. And he used the power of the world to call us to change our minds and live our lives for the better. And he gave his very self to let the world know that in God we can find forgiveness, compassion, mercy, love, peace, and eternal life. And on this day, let's remember and follow the innumerable examples set by the people who went through the 9-11 that day in New York and in Washington, D.C. and on Flight 93. Countless people offered the light that they had to guide their neighbors to safety. Countless people gave of themselves to save others. And in the days that followed, countless people lined up to to give blood and to supply construction workers and otherwise to help. Where is God in time of crisis? God is in the way we respond. And when we see a reflection of ourselves walking in the light of the Lord, I have all faith that we will recognize our true self. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and eternal, gracious God, thank you for shining the light of your love into our hearts. Thank you, O God, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, O God, for your presence, even in the darkest, loneliest, scariest moments of our lives. God, when it feels like the world is crashing down all around us, we pray that your Holy Spirit will remind us that you are ever with us, that you love us with an everlasting, steadfast love, and that you love us 
even until the end of our days and beyond. (coughs) And God, we thank you for your son Jesus who shows us the way. He came into this world and proclaimed your love, called us to change our minds and our lives for the better, that we may come to fully experience your love in this day, in the days, and in the days to come. And he gave his very self out of his love for us. And by believing in him, having faith in you through him, God, we understand that your love is everlasting, that we are forgiven of every sin from this day and for all days, and that we can one day look forward to his return into this world when he will make all things new and wipe away every tear. So God, we thank you for the new life that we have in him. And in our gratitude, we now offer you the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share our video. Let's send God's love all over the world. If you find yourself in Jensen Beach, Florida, please join us for worship. Our services are at 9, 15, and 11. And if you'd like to find out more, please visit www.trinityjb.org. See you next time. Blessings.